Merry Christmas everyone, this is Dr. Rakos. welcome to Piggy Board Gamer. In today's episode I will explain The Dwellings of Eldervale, a game designed by Luke Laurie. It's for 2-5 players mainly, but it also has a very nice solo mode. The game uses simple mechanics, but it has quite a few interesting twists. Today I will explain the normal game without any of the additional stuff, because yes, the game is simple, but it has quite a few details. So, if you like the normal game, then the box contains plenty of stuff to add to the game's replayability. So, let's start. There are 16 unique factions in the game, two for each one of the eight elements. Players may decide on the color they will play with, or they may choose at random using the eight starter cards. Players choose one card and gain the card as well as the tray with all their components. In this video I'm gonna set up for three players using fire, earth and water. The rest of the trays are not needed and are returned back to the box. Players place their tray in front of them and remove the lid. The lid contains two different factions for the players to choose from. The 16 factions differentiate with unit special powers that are written on the player's personal board. Players also have a virtual area called the Tableau where they're gonna be playing their adventure cards. There's no limit in how many cards can be played in their Tableau and all players place their starter card as the first card in their Tableau. Now let's move to the player's components. The player's units are a dragon, a warrior, a wizard and six workers. Players start the game with only three workers available which they move in their ready area. Players also have six rooftops and six dice. Now let's talk about resources which are organized in these neat little trays. We have gems, scrolls, potions, tools, swords, gold and magic cards which is a resource. Gold is regarded a wild resource and can be used instead of any other resource. Now magic cards offer various effects that are described on each card. We cannot explain every single card in the game but we can distinguish them in three different categories. Let's start with spells. Some spells are free and some others require a cost which is depicted here. This card for example requires the player to pay a gem or to meet the minimum elemental power requirement which in this case he doesn't have to pay the gem. The text of the card explains the effect and the timing when the card can be played. After playing spells, these cards are discarded. Next we have quest cards, which offer a condition that if the player meets, he will gain the depicted victory points. These cards, when played, are not discarded, but instead they are tucked below the player's board. Finally we have prophecy cards, which are used just in game scoring. At the end of the game, Players that have such cards in their hand, they reveal them and score victory points, again based on conditions. Players start the game with one gem, a scroll, a potion, a tool and a knife and they are dealt five magic cards from the stack. Throughout the game, players may never exceed five units from any one type and there's also a limit in magic cards, which is seven. During a player's turn, the player may exceed the 7 cards, but after he finishes his turn, he must discard to bring his hand back to limit. Finally, each player has a set of 6 player markers and I will explain now where these are placed. Continue by placing the scoring board in the middle of the table. The scoring board contains the 8 different elements of the game, but not all elements are used in each game. The elements of the player's chosen colors are always unlocked, but players need to choose or draw randomly two more elements to be used in the game. For this example, players have decided to use also light as well as chaos element. Next, place the monsters and their cards of the selected elements next to the board. These here are orbs and you need to place one of them in the top space of each elemental track that is used in the game. Also, you need to place another two orbs in the two designated spaces in the glory track. Now back to player's marker. Players place one of their markers in the first level of their corresponding element. They also place three of their markers next to these tracks that will be used when they gain power in other elements. Then players place one of their markers next and out of the glory track. 
Now, using any random way, players determine a first player who will place his last marker in the first space of the scoring track. Then the rest player in a clockwise manner will follow. Now, each one of these elements has a deck of adventure cards and one card that looks like a closed door that should be placed on top of this deck face down. Now, only for the elements that are in play, you need to unlock their decks by flipping the door card face up, but first make sure to shuffle all the cards of their deck. Last but not least, elements also have a set of 12 treasure tokens. Only for the elements in play, shuffle these tokens and organize them in four stacks of three tokens each. Place these tokens in the designated spaces face down. Now let's build Eldervale using these hexagonal tiles called realms. We have two types of realms in the game. We have elemental realms and these yellow outlined realms called ruins. There are three tiles corresponding to each one of the elements. We only need all the tiles of the elements that are in play. The rest of the tiles are returned back in the box. The elemental tiles that will be used are shuffled and placed face down in a stack. Now from this stack we're gonna need a specific number of tiles depending on player count as I show you in the graphics. So in a three player game we're gonna need seven tiles. Now start drawing tiles one after the other, paying attention for this icon. This is a lure and on this realm there will be a monster. There can only be one monster in the starting setup, so continue drawing tiles, but if you stumble upon another icon, you need to place this realm in the bottom of the stack and continue until you have the required number of realms. Now keep the selected realms for setup and shuffle the rest and then place this tray in the middle of the table. Now let's see the Ruin Realms. There are five major Ruin Realms, which is the Dungeon, the Portal, the Mill, the Fortress and the Mage Tower. In a normal game, we need all five of them. There are also two optional tiles, which I'm not gonna explain in this video. As you can see, there are two dungeon tiles and one of them is only used in a four or five player game. So in our setup, we're not gonna be needing the second one. So these five tiles, along with our selected elemental tiles, are gonna be shuffled face down and with these we're gonna create our starting build. In a two-player game, the build should look like this. In a three-player game, it should look like that. And in a four or five-player game, the build should look like that. As a final step, we need to place some additional stuff on our initial build. First of all, if there is a lair, place the corresponding monster on that realm. In all elemental realms, we see one or two treasure slots in their bottom part. For each one of these slots, pick a random stack of treasure tokens, flip them face upwards and place them in this slot. Do the same for all treasure slots in Everdale. If by now your setup area looks similar to this, then you're good to go. Now in this game players take turns performing specific actions starting with the first player and proceeding clockwisely and this continues until the end of the game is triggered. And when is that? The first way is the following. Everdale will be expanding using these tiles here. When the last tile is used then this triggers the end of the game. The second way is when one of the players has placed his sixth dwelling in Eldervale. In general, players are trying to accumulate victory points for the end of the game and they have pretty many ways to do that. However, the most important target is to relate what they are doing on the board to elements where they are mostly powerful. We should leave this here at that point, moving to gameplay explanation. On his turn, a player must choose one of two main actions. One is unit placement and the second is regroup. There are also some free actions that the player may perform as many of them before, during or after his main action. Let's start with the main actions first. Let's start with place a unit action. With this action the player places one of his units from his ready area to one of the realms in Eldervale and performs the action connected to this realm right after he places the unit. Now there are two different cases here. Case 1 is the player doesn't have any units on Eldervale. In this case, the player can place the unit on 
any unoccupied realm on Eldervale, and by unoccupied we mean that there are no enemy units nor any monster, so the player could place his unit here. Well, that's the normal rule, however, the warrior with his aggression power may be placed also in occupied spaces, either with enemy units or with monsters. This would trigger a battle, however, we will talk about battles later on. Case 2 is the player has some units already placed on Elder Vale. When that's the case, the player has to place his unit on a realm that is adjacent to a realm that he has already his units in. This hex can be occupied, but without any of his own units. Again, that's the normal rule. The dragon can be placed on any hex that is two hexes away from realms with the player's units, so it could be placed here. Finally, the wizard can be teleported on any unoccupied realm as if the player didn't have any units on Everdale. Now, as I said earlier, after the player places the unit, he must perform the action connected to this realm. Now, some actions require the player to pay some cost. If the player cannot pay that cost, then he cannot place the unit there from the beginning. Now, let us explain these actions. If the player places a unit on an elemental realm, he picks the top treasure tile from the stack and places it in one of his four spaces on his tray. If the realm has two stacks, the player decides which tile to take, and if a stack is depleted, then the player's option is depicted on the tile. Now this leaves us with the five ruin realms. Let's start with the fortress action. With this action, the player may pay any two of his resources and gain two coins from the bank. Now, don't forget that magic cards are resources and can be used to pay the cost to gain the coins. With the Mage Tower action, again the player pays any two of his resources and gains three magic cards from the supply, adding them to his hand. Then, the player must discard one of his cards and this card could be a card he previously had. With the Portal action, the player may summon one of his units that is on his tray and place it on his ready area, paying the cost that is indicated on his start card. After a unit is summoned, then the player will not have to buy it again. He will be able to use it for the rest of the game. With a mill action, the player builds a new dwelling on Elder Vale. Dwellings may only be built on elemental realms and there can be maximum one on each realm. To perform the action, the player must have a worker on such a realm and then pay the cost indicated on the realm and take one of his rooftops and plug it on his worker, transforming it to a dwelling. Now, this dwelling will remain there for the rest of the game. Next, the player scores two victory points for each ruined realm adjacent to the realm with a newly placed dwelling, as well as for any other dwelling adjacent to the new one that belongs to any player, so building this dwelling would give the player six victory points. Finally, the player gains elemental power connected to this realm, one point for each icon depicted on the top of the realm. When a player gains power on a specific element, he advances his marker one step for each point gain on the corresponding element's track. If the player gains power in an element he doesn't have a marker on, he uses one of his available markers to track this power gain. If the player has used all of his markers and he gains power in another element, then he has the option to move one of his markers and track this power gain to the new element. Finally, the player that reaches the last step of any element first gains the element's orb, which he can use in many different ways, we'll see in a bit. Finally, with a dungeon action, the player adds a new realm in Elder Vale. When that happens, follow this procedure. First, the player draws the top realm from the stack and then he must decide where to place it. New realms must be placed adjacent to at least two other realms, so this is not okay, but this is okay. After that, the player must prepare the new realm. If there is a lair, he places the monster and he also places a stack of treasure tokens. Step 2 is that the player gains a face-up adventure card by paying its cost depicted in the top right corner of the card. Now, this card doesn't have to be the same element with the realm he just placed. It can be taken from any unlocked stack. 
The player also gains a power advancement in the element track corresponding to the card he just chose. After the player pays the cost and gains the one power, he places the card in his tableau. Step 3 is the player may choose to either gain another adventure card the same way we said on step 2, or he may discard any card by placing it face down in the bottom of the stack. Don't forget that the player may only choose face-up cards to do what he wants. The last step of the process is to flip face-up the top card from all the stacks he affected. With the regroup action, the player brings all his units from Elder Vale and from the Underworld back to his ready area. And through this process, he may also activate his adventure cards in his tableau. First, for each of the player's units on Elder Vale, the player may either activate one of his cards in his tableau or bring him straight to his ready area. Some adventure cards don't activate. This one, for example, just gives a permanent bonus. If an adventure card is activated by a unit, it depicts the unit type it requires in the center of the card. This card, for example, requires a wizard to be activated. If the card depicts a worker, then the player may use any unit type to activate that card. This is important. Each adventure card may only be activated once on each regroup phase. The starter card also offers to the player three different actions that can all be activated using three separate units. The first action is Summon, which is exactly the same as if the player has used the portal. The second action is Gather, with which the player receives the resources depicted in the middle of the card. The last action is Dwell, which again is exactly the same as if the player has used the mill. The second step is to move all of the player's units from the underworld straight to his ready area. The last step of the process is to return units from your cards to your ready area. After a player regroups for the first time, he advances his marker to the first space of the glory track. Now let's talk about free actions. On his turn, a player may perform as many free actions as he wishes before, during or after his main action. As a free action, a player may discard one treasure token and receive the depicted resources from the supply. Another free action could be to place a treasure token in any one adventure card slot. Slots are these square-shaped icons on the cards. By placing this token here, when the player gathers, he gains a gem instead of a potion. Or the player could place the token in this slot here, which is a door card. When doors are activated, they grant the player the depicted resources. However, if the player has placed a treasure token here, he will also gain these resources if he has the most power in the element track of this element. Some other cards require a treasure token, otherwise they cannot be activated. By placing a treasure token here, you can activate the card and this token is what you need to pay to receive this reward. After you place a token in a slot, you cannot move it. However, you may replace it with a new token and the old one is removed from the game. The player could also play magic cards from his hand as free actions. Finally, as a free action, the player may use his orbs. An orb has three different uses. One of them is to place the orb in an adventure card that depicts the orb symbol in the top left corner. After placing the orb, the card gains augmented powers that are written on the card. Another use is in adventure cards that require an input. If you place an orb there, then when the card is activated, it gives the reward without having to pay any cost. And last, an orb can be used in the orb rewards track. The player chooses any reward that has no orb on and gains that reward. Regarding adventure cards, I would also like to add there are some cards that are auras. These cards are played on other cards and they give various effects. After being connected to a card, auras cannot be moved to another card unless the player pays again the cost of the aura. Dwellings of Elder Vale involves battling as well. However, the game starts in a peaceful beginning state during which no battle can be triggered. This state lasts until all players' glory track markers step inside the glory track. And how does that happen? 
As I said, after a player regroups for the first time, he places his marker in the first space of the glory track. So, after the last player regroups for the first time, peaceful beginning is over and battles can now be triggered. Now, what triggers a battle? If a player places one of his units in an occupied realm, either from his opponents or from a monster, or if a monster moves to an occupied realm, this triggers a battle. Now, this is important. Battle will initiate after the player performs the realm's action. So, no matter what, this action will be performed. And after that, battle initiates in a process I will now explain. So, in our example, the blue player places a unit here, performs the action, he picks up a tile, places it on his board, and now a battle is initiated. The first step of the battle is join. All players may choose to join the battle with units from adjacent realms, starting with the player that sits on the left of the player that triggered the battle and moving clockwisely. The red player chooses to join battle with his dragon and his worker and then the green player has a call even if he didn't have any units in the contested space and joins battle with just his wizard. The blue player who has the last call decides not to advance his wizard to the battle realm. The second step is to determine the number of battle dice each player will be rolling. Now, each unit type contributes a specific number of dice also written on the player's personal board. Workers and wizards contribute one die, warriors contribute two, and dragons contribute three dice. Also, each dwelling that is inside the battle realm or in an adjacent one contributes one die to the owner. Now, all players may use their special powers, play magic cards to adjust, to modify the number of dice they will be throwing in the battle. However, no matter what, no player may roll more than six dice. The third step is that all players may spend their swords for an additional die for each sword they spend. Again, starting with the player that sits on the left of the player who triggered the battle and moving clockwisely. The red and the green player decide not to spend their swords and the blue player who has the last call decides to spend his sword for a plus one die in the battle. Now, all players will roll their dice simultaneously and check the results that will determine the winner. The battle is won by the player with the highest die result. Yes, even a player with one die could win the battle against a player that rolled multiple dice. Again, at this point, players could play cards that could alter their die results. We see here that the red and the blue player tie for their highest value die, so we go on and check their next highest die, and then the next, and so on and so forth, until a winner is determined, which here is the red player. If there is a true tie after all dice have been compared, then all players lose that battle. The winner keeps his units in the realm and gets one glory. He advances his marker in the glory track and gains any bonus depicted in the space. If a player has maxed out his glory, then each time he gains glory, he receives two victory points instead. Now, all losers of the battle move all their units from the realm to the underworld and for each unit they have removed, they gain one sword to fight better next time. Monsters are neutral creatures that come into play after their lair appears on the board, along with their card that contains their various powers that start to apply immediately and for as long as the monster is on the map of Eldervale. Players may attack a monster by placing a unit in their realm, however, also monsters may attack players with their rush ability. Whenever a player places a unit in a realm that is adjacent to a realm with a monster, the monster rushes and enters that realm. This, of course, will cause a battle. There can only be one monster in one realm, so if that placement had more than one monster in adjacent realms, then the player would choose which monster would rush. If, however, the game is at a peaceful beginning state, monsters don't rush. Whenever a monster is involved in a battle, it rolls the number of dice depicted in the bottom right corner of its card. The color of the dice is not important. When a monster is defeated in battle, it is normally removed from the game along with its card, and the player that won the combat can gain a power advancement of the corresponding element or take the normal glory track advancement. Let's clarify something that has to do with the monster's abilities on its card. Now, all the effects apply 
for as long as the monster is on Elder Vale. The Ancient Trends effect, for example, says that whenever the Mage's Tower is activated, it produces an additional card. So as long as the Ancient Trend is on Elder Vale, all players can use this advantage. Now, there are certain effects that allow a player to dominate a monster. When that happens, the player gets the monster in his board, it is now his unit, as well as the card that enters his tableau. When monsters are dominated, effects with the link symbol only affect the player that dominates them. Other effects without the link symbol still affect everyone, even if they are dominated. In our example, only the blue player now gains the additional card from the mage tower and again only after he places his monster in Elder Vale. The player may use his monster for placement like a normal unit placement and if it's involved in battle, the monster contributes its dice for the player. There are certain effects that would allow a monster to return to its lair. If there are any units there, they are sent immediately to the underworld. And if the monster's lair was occupied by another monster, then the monster would have to move to the nearest unoccupied realm. And if there are more than one, the active player chooses which one. As I've said in the game's overview, the game's end is triggered with two ways. If a player builds the last tile in Everdale, or if he builds his sixth dwelling. When that happens, all players will have one last turn, including the player that has triggered the scoring. In this example, the red player has triggered the game's end by building his sixth dwelling. After the green and the blue player take their last turn, the game will end with the red player's last turn. After that, we proceed with scoring. First of all, all unspent orbs give the player one victory point each. Next, the player gains the victory points depicted next to the positions of his markers in the elements track. Next, players score their dwellings. For each dwelling, players score victory points according to their markers position in the corresponding elements track. Players then score victory points for the cards in their tableau. Each card scores victory points equal to the player's marker in the corresponding element track. However, there is a limit. The player can score three adventure cards for each dwelling he has built. So the blue player with three built dwellings can score up to nine adventure cards. Vault adventure cards like this one give objectives to the player that if it's satisfied at the end of the game, they give victory points. So at this point, players gain victory points from their vault cards. Finally, players reveal their prophecy cards and gain the victory points depicted on them. The player that has accumulated the most victory points is declared the winner and if there is a tie, the remaining resources will be used as a tiebreaker. After that, all tied players share their victory. And that was Dwellings of Elder Vale. If you liked that video and want to see more, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. If you found that I've missed something in the rules, please write it in the comment section and until next time, have fun and play more board games.